thank you. I'm going to put my little iPad and my time on there. It's always dangerous to give me a microphone and a podium. So I'm going to try to keep on track today. Um, I'm very excited to be here today for two main reasons. Um, the first one is that I didn't have to take a flight to O'Hare to hang out with this wonderful group. Um, so welcome to our backyard here. And the other reason is that we will be talking today and tomorrow about challenges and solutions, which means that we've moved the needle. This is not a group where inertia uh, lives. We have moved from this idea of taking rights of ways and other operational lands and turning them into functional habitat for pollinators. And because we're doing that, we're running into challenges. So it's something that we should definitely celebrate. And um, a few months ago now, um, Iris and Jessica asked me to come and chat a little bit about something else that I think will be of benefit to this group. And that's how um, I come with a very good message and a surprise. Um, there's been others, some in this room, some not in this room, that have been doing what we're trying to do for 30 years. And I think we should definitely tap into their knowledge, into their solutions, into their best management practices so that our work can become even easier. So those 30 years of um, practitioners really um, have occurred on different types of lands. Uh, you'll see here from some of those participants, it's not always on rights of ways, it's not always on grasslands, it's not always at the scale we're thinking of here, but certainly the questions that they ask themselves, the answers, the answers that, that they've come up with are things that we um, can use, can talk about, and can share today. And when we're looking at what do these clusters of really good pollinator habitat look like, you'll see that um, they've been implemented across the United States and Canada, also in 20 some other countries, but we'll focus on that today. And each and every one of these dots that has a pollinator focus has something that we can learn from. And I know I sound like a broken record already, and for those of you who have met me before, I'm gonna say it again, we need to learn from one another. And I've started to take this broken record on the show, and I've been meeting with the folks from the Wildlife Society and some of the universities to tell them that their great research is something that we also need to learn uh, from, but we can't do it from reading journals at our desk on a daily basis because we don't have time to do that. So trying to also bridge that gap and tapping into that really good research, these innovations, these advances in science is something else that benefits this, this wonderful map. So this map of pollinator projects, we said 30 years, we recorded our first pollinator project um, in 1990, and that was the first year we were actually recording projects. So it's, it's safe to think that these projects had been on the ground for more than, than, than that particular year. So um, we're going to average that to 30 years. Um, it's also the first year we recorded grassland habitat restoration on operating lands. So again, something that we've been talking about, something that we're all concerned with. In the past two years, um, out of the sexiness of pollinators and pollinator habitat, we've had an increase of projects that have been recorded that do um, cater to pollinators. Um, so in 2016 and 17, that's 137 projects. That's a lot of pollinator focus, a lot of folks out there monitoring for them and also making sure that their life cycles are being met. In that same period of time, we had 217 grassland, prairie, meadow, and the variety of different names that you can call them also recorded. So we're talking here about much larger scale implementation for pollinators. And I'm going to ask you to look at the map again. You know where you're from, and you know where you operate. So if you look at that map and you see dots that are in your neighborhoods, on your operating areas, that also means that someone else has been doing it and that you can probably shamelessly steal their approach, their vendors, their suppliers, 
and ask for their data in terms of what did they do, when did they do it, and what happened in terms of outcomes. So um, that map is accessible in an interactive form. Um, it's called the WHC Index. And if you Google that, Wildlife Habitat Council Index, you'll get an interactive map you can click on. And the more you click, the more you see the little dots. You can click on the dot. It gives you the landowner name, um, and we can put you in touch with them. But more interesting than that is the size of these patches, of these grasslands. So the smallest one in the past two years was 0.2 um, acres. I can't see that far, um, so I hope that I'm right, 0.2 acres. So for our Canadian friends, uh, that's about 80 square meters. Um, and then the largest one was 150,000 acres, which I'm not even going to try to calculate in my head in square meters, um, a very large patch of land um, in terms of a mining restoration, right? So very difficult condition, poor soils, all kinds of challenges there. This is a very, very tiny slide for all of you to read. Um, these are uh, basically the projects by industry sector. And the reason I wanted to chat through this is that you'll see that the majority of the projects are occurring in the energy and utility sector, which we have a large representation in this room, so go utilities. Um, but you're also going to see that some other industry sectors have definitely um, worked on those challenges, um, have pursued these types of projects, and their context might be very different than yours. So they're typically not working on rights of ways, um, they um, have different types of budgets, they have different types of stakeholders, but they each have their own story. So if you're thinking about their roadmap, so they all had to go through the business case, the design and planning of their project, their implementation, which Marla is going to talk about in a little bit, um, m and &E, figuring out what's working out, what's not working out, are we meeting our objectives, and then also talking about it, the whole storytelling aspect of what we're doing. So think about these industry sectors and the story they would tell you about their own organizational challenges, which is really around the business case, the planning, and then the evaluation and storytelling. They would have a whole lot of snakes and ladders to talk about. So in the manufacturing industry, some of their challenges, um, so that you know, you know if it resonates with you, um, they're faced with a lot of pressure on um, what looks good and what it should look like. What should a manufacturing plant look like? It needs to be manicured. It needs to be pretty. It needs to be reflective of the company culture. So for them to do grassland habitat, pollinator habitat, that's, a, that's an issue. And I think some of you in the room, even if you're not in manufacturing, are facing the same challenges. Um, in the chemical industry, they're dealing a lot with uh, remediation lands that they're trying to improve, poor soils, heavily regulated, and very little flexibility. Um, so if they're putting a seed mix into um, a government paper that goes to the EPA, that's the seed mix they're going to have to use. It's really difficult to then go back and get a change. And I think some of you, if you're working with NERC or FERC, you're going to end up in the same situation. Um, another industry that has something to offer, um, oh yeah, again, manufacturing, a lot of um, hourly employees that are unionized, and I think some of your contractors that do the work on some of your projects are in the same spot where um, you have to be very careful what you're asking them to do because then it's a new job creation, so that's another small headache. Um, and then finally, one of the um, other um, sectors that sometimes we forget about is the mining or aggregate and construction materials. So they're also dealing with a lot of social license to operate issue, pressure from the public. They're operating usually in social justice areas where um, the community needs are very different. So um, investing into pollinator habitat when maybe they should be investing in uh, job trainings or capacity building in the community is a very difficult balance and a difficult message to uh, translate to their stakeholders. So I'm going to ask you a question. Recently, I think it was three, three months ago, I put 15 participants of a workshop like today in a room and I asked them, just like we did this morning, to list some challenges they were facing in developing an approach for 
um, stewardship activities, pollinator, grasslands, and a few others. And I asked them, okay, go ahead and list your challenges. And I gave them four minutes. So how many challenges did this wonderful group of 15 people, how many were they able to list in four minutes? So was it under 10? Between 10 and 50? Between 50 and 99? Or 100? I'm going to ask for some volunteers to at least give me an indication of what they think happened. C. Hmm. You can phone a friend. Um, it was a hundred. And the only reason it's a hundred is that I had capped the uh, capture um, software that we use. You know, when you do interactive polling, I had said like, oh, I'm going to cap this at a hundred. Like these 15 participants are never going to find a hundred reasons not to do this. Like that's not going to happen. And it stopped. So actually I was going to give them like 15 minutes to come up with their challenges. It stopped at four because like the machine broke. So we're in a much better position here. Um, because we've already laid out a lot of our challenges um, over the past few meetings. And when you look at them, it's not like a long laundry list. And today we're going to work um, to identify any new ones that we thought about, um, any new challenges because of the progress we're making. And we're going to also try to think about solutions. So we're in a much better position than this group who decided to um, go beyond problem solving and did solution blocking. Um, but that's another story. Um, that's my monarch story. That people just are so good at finding reasons not to do something. Um, all right, sorry, back on track. So we have challenges that we've identified. And I think I would like to offer two suggestions for us to keep in mind today and tomorrow as we're trying to identify solutions. The first one is we can play Einstein. Einstein said, and he was a very smart man, he said, if I had to save the planet in an hour, I would take 59 minutes to define the problem and one minute to find the solution. So today, as we're talking about challenges and our human nature goes into high gear to find more challenges, we're so good at risk analysis and having discussions around fatal flaws. So we're going to try to play Einstein a bit and really think about, well, why is this a problem? And if you have an answer, ask yourself about that answer, why is this still a problem? And get to the core of what really is the challenge. And only when we get to the core of these challenges, we're going to be able to find the simplest viable solutions. And the second thing we can do is um, try something or agree to a solution, if even, even if it's not perfect. So it would be really great to all see each other again in October at the next meeting where we can say, we'll talk about our near misses and some of our failures and see how we can solve that rather than being in the same room near O'Hare and uh, talking about how we're just really still stuck um, with, our, with our challenges. So I did a tiny bit of homework with my team. We looked at the challenges that had been listed so far by this group, and we called a few folks, and we looked at how they solved some of these challenges over the years, and we tried to boil the solutions down to a few bite-sized pieces for us to maybe have in front of us. I don't know if you can even read that. You might want to take notes. Um, and I'm going to talk for a few minutes about those five potential solutions that seem to answer most everything um, before I answer some of your questions. So the first one, and, and in no particular order, um, objective setting. So it looks like a lot of the challenges we're facing um, arise from maybe our objectives not being clear. And I'll give you an example. So we know that one of our challenges is the price of seed mixes of um, those high quality, high diversity seed, seed mixes and that we get sticker shock um, on, on different projects. 
So why is this a problem, right? So it's a problem because we have limited amount of money and we want to do a good job. And why is this a problem? It's a problem because we want to try to enhance 160 mile of pipeline right of way as part of a capital project. So why is this a problem? You know, you continue, 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 and you realize that your objective may be in this case to start to introduce new practices into your company or your organization. And that's really what you're trying to do. And then maybe the scope and scale and the high diversity of the seed mix is not that important because your objective is not to provide a measure to your state DNR about the percent increase of foraging habitat quality you have on site, right? Completely different objectives can call for different approaches if you exactly know what you're trying to accomplish. And I think understanding that and being flexible in your objectives will solve a lot of our challenges that we have on that list that we've collated over the past few, um, over the past few years. So here's another one. Um, communication, and I'm not talking broad communication. We need to talk about pollinators. We each need to be better communicators at those institutional steps the steps that happen within your organizations, making the business case, being able to talk to your C-suites, your VPs, your executive sponsors, your team members about what you're doing and why it's important. And also recognizing that sometimes we're not the best people to talk about something. So if you're a super technical person and you're the best person to talk to Mark Feely of Earned Seeds when it's time to figure out what you're gonna seed, you may not be the right person to go and talk to your VP to try to convince that person that doing pollinator habitat will be amazing for their sustainability reporting. So if we recognize that and that we're not experts in everything, I think we're going to open the door to more collaboration on communication that will be more successful. I recently learned that trying to talk to Costco to add my condo to their insurance so it could get a dishwasher delivered. I was not the right person to talk to them about that. I have no idea what I was asking for. All right, open collaboration. This is a, a pet project of, uh, of WHC, a pet project of mine. This idea that we each have data, we each have a lot of information that would be so helpful to have in a central place that we can share but we run into issues of confidentiality agreements, into uh, client slash consulting um, um, contracts. But there's so much information out there that we need to share. And that's a solution, is to share it, to find ways for us to openly share that information. And it doesn't need to be the whole thing. Sometimes extract of something, conversations around it, but this idea of open communication really is a solution to a lot of our challenges. Socialization. So I'm gonna to to give you two stories. Hmm, no, a good one and a bad one. So bad story on socialization. When General Motors went through bankruptcy, they needed to really uh, tighten their purse strings and save money. So at their Warren Tech Center in Warren, Michigan, they stopped mowing a lot of their really lovely turf. And when that happened, they started seeing that the habitats that were being created were actually in pretty good condition. There wasn't a lot of invasive species. They started overseeding. They did some plugs. They, they basically created these really lovely grasslands that, of course, are great pollinator habitats. So now that they have more money, um, one of the VPs, new to the facility, he wasn't there through the bankruptcy, um, asked the landscaping company directly as an executive order to clean up the place and start mowing these areas back. So that's a lot of time and money invested in these beautiful grasslands that are completely going to waste because the team out there was responsible for these habitats did two things or forgot to do two things. First, they forgot to socialize up about why this is there, what's the value, what would be the impact of not having that anymore? Because they didn't even think there was a threat. And then the other thing is they didn't socialize with their peers and the other folks that would see that or know about it. So that when the VP started talking about this ugly, ugly area in front of the building, that they would have been able to say, oh, no, wait, that's not an ugly area. 
that's a wildlife habitat, that's a pollinator habitat, this is how we use it. So they, uh, yeah, I think that in those two areas, they just missed a mark. A good success story, uh, Shell out uh, at their um, headquarters in Wood Creek, that's just outside of uh, Houston, they had pollinator habitat for a long time. Nobody was caring about them. Nobody knew about them. It was this forgotten piece of land in their back 40. So they started a campaign next to each of their um, key card or fob um, squares on the walls. I don't know how you call that, those little plates where you swipe your, your card to get entry to your level and, and your office. So next to each of them, they put a really pretty picture of a monarch and said something like, the monarch migrates from you know this place to that place, they also need their key card or something like that. You know, it was to, re to make people, um, to remind them to bring their key card with them when they leave the building. But then it said, come and look at our monarch habitat there and there, right? So it's a little reminder, but it made everyone understand that, oh, we have monarch habitat. Oh, the company cares about it. They're putting this all over our headquarters. Um, so I should probably be paying attention. So the next time they did a blog post about their pollinator habitat and how their employees could do something about it at home, they had the largest download hit of all of their blogs so far within the company. So that tiny piece of socialization of everyone swiping next to it really had a huge impact. So do socialize, go ahead. Um, and the last one is the risk tolerance. And, and I'm just going to mention this. Every organization, every company, every agency has uh, a different risk tolerance. And sometimes we forget to ask about that and to translate that into what does that give me room to do and how much can I fail? And I think that the projects we're talking about implementing in each of our own sectors can be scaled up, can be scaled down, can be adapted to fit that risk tolerance that you are operating in. Because you won't be able to change that risk tolerance in a day. That's just not gonna happen. So understanding that and knowing what questions to ask so you can assess it will give you, I think, a pathway on how much I can do and is it okay for me to fail at it. And then finally, there are some things we will never be able to solve. This is um, one of my favorite cartoons from The New Yorker. Your proposal is innovative. Unfortunately, we won't be able to use it because we've never tried something like this before. I'm sure many of us have <laughs> run through that before. Um, your culture is your culture, and that will take a number of months, years to change. And it may mean that your great idea of a pollinator habitat or, you know, a big enhancement for pollinator um, might be put on hold for a year or two while instead you do a really as important project on education and awareness about pollinators. Right? There are alternatives that can fit within your culture, within the risk tolerance, within the budget, and still move that needle forward in terms of getting more on the ground. And that is it for me today. Are there any questions? I'm gonna put my glasses back. Okay. No questions. We do have time for questions and discussion. So um, just a reminder, if you have a question, please use the microphone at your table. So um, those of uh, our attendees that are joining by web can hear the question. Table six really wants to ask a question, but they don't have a mic. <laughs> yes. Hey, um, uh, I'm Kerry Jane King. I'm with the New York Power Authority. I'm actually in sustainability, so I was interested in your comments about uh, collaboration and uh, communication and the sustainability report. And that's probably why I'm here. Um, I was interested in learning a bit more about. Um, the certification program and whether any organizations have sort of done an outreach around employees getting certified in their backyards or whether I was kind of, I'm trying to develop a program internally and thinking about how to go with that. 
So I would say that Shell is one of the companies that has metrics that track how their initiatives internally at the corporation have uh, ramifications into their communities. So they track that. Um, other companies track number of, of community members educated um, or engaged in any of these initiatives, whether it's a hands-on initiative or an initiative that targets just increased awareness um, and engagement. So there's different metrics that are being used that are fairly compatible with GRI, the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, that can um, answer some of those questions by using these kind of proxy parameters, proxy metrics. Um, thank you, Joanne. In terms of the, the linear lines that we manage uh, in your certification program, um, can you speak a little bit about if you enroll, um, let's say, 400 miles, is the entire 400 miles certified or the pockets? Um, how does that work technically in the certification program? That's an interesting question. I won't go into too much details, but um, there, there, there are two options for linear features. So if you're into an approach where you're really finding kind of your hot spots for um, enhancements, and I think a lot of the companies and uh, a lot of you in the room that start with their programs will find pockets and then you'll do like a half mile here or um, you, you have capital money somewhere else and you do a little pocket there. And that in that case, those are recognized individually as projects. But if you're doing, let's say, IVM on your entire system and where one of your IVM objectives is to enhance habitat for pollinators, then that would fall into a different category and that gets recognized as its own thing. And then I think there was another question. Um, on your map, I'm kind of a map geek. And uh, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do in the Fish and Wildlife Service is capture and catalog habitat that's already out there and that will persist into the future through some kind of certification. Have we approached you about um, in incorporating that? And, um, you know, I, I know there's a lot of issues with data sharing, but it's nice to see that. And I know a lot of other organizations do similar things, but we're extremely interested in um, finding a way to use that so we can have that in our analysis. Um, so I just, I'm just curious if, uh, if we've worked together on that. Our map geeks and your map geeks are chatting. <laughs> Excellent. Good. Anything else? Well, thank you so much. Um, I do hope that we can focus on solutions today and tomorrow um, and have a discussion about mini failures the next time we see each other. Thank you.